Hey guys, what is up? Super K-Man Rocks here, and I am here for my NACL round number two overview and analysis video. I guess that's what I'm titling this, round two. I think that's the fair way to end up titling this. This is kind of lower bracket round one, lower bracket round two, the start of our lower bracket. That's essentially what we are going to be going over here today, the second weekend of games, and that means three best of fives to cover. And now that we are in the best of five stage, I am going to be covering these game by game. So that means we've got a lot to cover in today's video. It's certainly going to be the longest NACL video we have filmed over the course of this year, so I don't want to waste you guys this time too much in the beginning. If you're interested in my thoughts on the first weekend on round one, check out the video up in the iCard. You can also check out the playlist up there for every single week of the NACL done in a similar format to what we are going to get today, but we're going to be in even more detail because if you are new to this format, what we are going to do is go game by game in all three series, talking about the advantages and the disadvantages that each team was able to generate. I'll be giving a player of the game and a dud of the game for each game that we cover. And at the end of each series, I will be giving a player of the series to kind of tie everything into a nice, neat little bow. At the end of the video, we will be quickly talking about the upcoming matchups, the next rounds that we have moving forward. But again, almost all of today is going to be spent talking about our three series that kicked off the lower part of the bracket. So without further ado, let's jump right into the analysis, shall we? And that means kicking it off with our first series of the lower bracket. One of the teams here is making their playoff debut here in the NACL, their first ever best of five, their first ever series here in the NACL playoffs. The other team unfortunately got knocked down in round one, but certainly is looking for a bounce back. It's the number five seeded Blue Otter taking on the number eight seeded Winthrop University. This is definitely an intriguing matchup because I don't think either of these teams were necessarily predicted to even be here in the playoffs. In fact, these were my predicted bottom two teams at the beginning of the split when you go and look at like my you know May uh, June power rankings before everything ended up starting here in the NACL I had these two teams near the bottom and both of them have overperformed expectations and I think both of them have clearly shown a lot of you know strength and, and win conditions and, and just resilience in the early game but I do think that one team has certainly looked a little bit better than the other at least in terms of recency bias and that is Blue Otter who has been one of genuinely the scarier teams in the NACL over the past couple of weeks they've been able to win against basically anybody. They picked up some strong wins against teams like Team Liquid Challengers and FlyQuest Challengers, and obviously they fell to Supernova in the first round, but even that was a really close best of three that wasn't exactly a complete blowout in favor of Supernova, who did play a little bit rough. You know, Otter definitely had some things they could improve on, but there was a lot to like about this team. I think when you're looking at some of the advantages that Otter could potentially have in this series, one of the places I'm really looking at is the top lane. I really like Quacker. I think that he is a very feast or famine player, but when it works, when he wins, he wins super hard, harder than almost any other top laner in the league. And Denethor has not exactly been the most consistent player on the other side of this matchup. But really, when you're looking at the like matchup of the series for me, it's very clearly the bot lane, the AD carries in particular, Levitate taking on Aaron. I think whichever one of these bot laners is able to get a better position in this series is, is in a really good spot. And the case for Levitate is that he has been absolutely on fire as of late. He has been an absolute menace for Otter, genuinely one of the best AD carries in the the league, especially over the past month or so. He's really leveled up over the course of this year, and if he can get going, if he can play the way that he did in the last couple of weeks of the regular season, then I think Otter has a really good shot to just kind of destroy this series. Him and Robex have been a really great duo, and they've really come alive as of late. Music and Samakin are both really good players. Samakin in particular is somebody that I've been hyping up a lot because of his willingness to kind of sacrifice his own lane, move around the map, and be kind of a team player. In terms of how he wants to play the map, I'm always very partial to that style out of mid laners, and Samakin really fits that mold. Overall, Blue Otter has a very clear idea of what they want to do, but they need to get better at being able to close out games because they're really strong in the early game. They've been very good at being able to generate leads, and they've just not been super clinical at turning those leads into distinct advantages in the late game, especially if they're smaller. I want to see that mid game, that late game prio end up getting a little bit better. I think it has gotten better, but if you can really lock that down, this team is going to be a true force to be reckoned with. And then for Winthrop on the other side... They've also got a ton of positives. Again, I talked about the AD carry position. That's where they found a lot of their wins over the course of this year is getting Aaron ahead and getting Aaron into a good position. Aaron has been really solid, really actually very good at this level for a while now. He was really good in spring as well. I think people were underestimating him because Wildcard was just a very 
not good team in a lot of different areas, but Aaron was the strength of that team for me, and he's continued to be that for Winthrop University. He has been somebody that you can genuinely play through almost every single game, and he will give you a similar output. I'm not sure if he has the same kind of high caps as someone like Levitate does, or at least we haven't seen that so far this split, but I certainly think he could have a better series if they're able to get him into a nice position. One thing that also might be of interest, Skytech is out. He's not playing in this series. Chookies is coming in and playing in the support position. I'm not sure. I don't remember if Chucky's has played at the tier two level, but obviously somebody who has had a ton of success at the tier three at the collegiate level in the past. And the only real concern for me with him in terms of his resume is that, uh, at least as far as I remember, I, I don't remember the last time he played without mobility. It must be two plus years ago. In terms of the bot lane duo, he's not really had to pair up with anybody else in terms of the bot lane duo. So we'll see how he ends up adapting. He also hasn't had a ton of time to integrate himself with some of the other members of this team, but he played on Winthrop. He played with Denethor in the Sea Law Championships. Like, they've had this in their back pocket. They just wanted to go with a lot of the wild card, the slew players for a lot of this year. But, you know, opting into Chookies, I think, might actually give this team a bit of a higher floor. I think Chookies is a very good support, and I honestly understand the idea behind this decision, but a lot of Winthrop's, you know, successes or failures do come down to the jungle position, and Winnie. Winnie is very much that feast or famine type of jungler. I compare him a lot to a player like Chad, if you're familiar with Chad, which you should be if you're watching this video, but uh, the good games look really good, and, and the bad games look really bad, and you just have to hope that they roll well on any given day. If Winnie is winning in the jungle, if he is super far ahead in those matchups, Winthrop is honestly one of the hardest teams to beat in the entire league. They themselves have pulled off a bunch of upsets. They beat FlyQuest Challengers earlier on in the split, and so we know that they can win a lot of games that maybe they're not supposed to. Both of these teams have made a killing this split off of upsetting teams that didn't take them seriously. Now both of them are fighting for their playoff lives, and only one can come out on top, and only one can move forward. So who will it be? Well, of course, to figure that out, we gotta go game by game, and that means starting with game number one. So let's get into it. The winner of game number one was... Blue Otter, they are going to take game number one. They're going to go up in this series one to nothing, and this is the exact kind of way you want to start out this series if you're one of these teams. You want to just kind of dominate game number one, draft a comp that has a couple of outs, a couple of win conditions, especially in full fearless. We'll get into that more as we go further along in the series because I think some people forgot that it was full fearless. Maybe not obviously in the series, but a lot of the conversation I think surrounding these drafts was, um, oh, I, I think we forgot it was best of five full fearless and so there are a lot of things that are off the table and you have to completely plan drafts very differently in these formats. And I think Blue Water for an off meta, very strange kind of like Wombo Combo-esque draft, this really works out. Now I'll say Winthrop probably has the better quote unquote Wombo Combo because you've got the Rumble plus Orianna, you've got Vi for lockdown, potentially Ori Shockwave into MF bullet time. Like you've got so much setup in terms of these big like Wombo Combo type of fights. You want to close things out with every ultimate just kind of layered on top of each other. The problem was that Blue Otter was just quite frankly better at that throughout a lot of this game, and a lot of that has to go on Samakin, who is going to get my player of the game here in game number one. I don't think Aurora is broken. I've talked about that a lot. I think a lot of people right now are talking about Aurora as this champion that just cannot be beaten. I think she has clear advantages and disadvantages. Her disadvantages are usually her ability to 1v1 lane, especially in the early game. I think that's even more prevalent in the mid lane. I think her laning phase is way better in top lane, where she doesn't get abused nearly as much. You don't see nearly as many like leads for the enemy. You don't have that many great laners in the top lane right now that are able to take advantage of her individual skill set, but her pick potential in the late game is obviously very well documented. It's arguably the best in the game at the current moment, and if she is able to get to that part of the game and start to take over, it's really going to work out. I talked about Samakin as a player that I really like because play style wise he fits into the idea of a mid laner that I think is really strong right now, which is a player that, you know, is okay in lane. Like, I'm certainly not saying Samakin is a bad laner, but, you know, it's not his focus. He wants to move around the map. He wants to be a bit of a macro threat, and in this game, you've got Gragas plus Yasuo, and your job is to make sure that that bot lane becomes easier and easier. And man, the Gragas Yasuo combo very much ended up working out. Samakin moving around the map, being willing to sacrifice resources in order to make a lot of these plays happen. That's why they had such a gigantic lead going into the mid game and why the Yasuo was essentially unstoppable by the time we hit the late game. Rovex was awesome in this game on the Yasuo. Really excited to see Rovex get a little bit of the spotlight. He has been really good over the course of this split, but I feel like Levitate has taken a lot of the shine away from him, if only because of just 
how good he individually has been, but Rovex definitely deserves a big shout out as well. Music was very good on the Gragas. Those were the three players that I think stood out, but Levitate was very good as well on the Senna, just in a little bit of a lessened role because the Wombo combo didn't necessarily involve her as much. Quacker was fine as well. Um, Blue Otter was just good. I think playing through Sam again and allowing him to just kind of choose where he wants to put the pressure, getting that Yasuo ahead and making that, you know, Gragas Yasuo combo very difficult to deal with in the late game. That's a great win condition, especially in a full fearless format. And then for Winthrop on the other side, I just don't think they executed their comp very well. You needed to be able to, at the very least, survive the early game. You're looking at a Senna, Gragas, Yasuo, like Aurora comp. You just need to make sure that you're not going into 20 minutes getting absolutely pulverized because then there's really not a lot of opportunities for you to be able to win, but they were not active enough in the early game for it to actually work out. Winnie is going to get my dead of the game here on the Vi. We talk about it all the time for Winthrop. When Winnie is winning, then this team does really well when he is outpaced and when the enemy jungler is able to just do more in the early game. That can sometimes be a pretty major issue for Winthrop, and that's kind of what happened here. I just don't think his pathing was all that good. I think it's fair to look at Denethor as a potential dead of the game as well, because man, he just did absolutely nothing on the Rumble. Like, this was just not a good game. He was targeted quite a bit early on, and in these fights, and there just wasn't a lot that he could actually do. He was kind of the subject of a lot of the big engages, but I think Winnie losing pressure, losing tempo in the early game was a tad bit more important to me. I think Darkwing's, Aaron, Chookies, they were generally, like, not the problem. I think Ori, at generally, as a pick right now, is just way too slow. I think a lot of the other regions have caught on to that, but again, full fearless, I can only be so critical of some of these draft picks because teams just don't want to spend all of their good picks on game number one, but, you know, Winthrop is one of those teams that has to bounce back here. As much as I would trust this team to win a game or two against Blue Otter, I, it's hard to win three games in a row, really, at any level against any team, and so uh, this is an important game in game number two for them to win. If Otter can get that 2-0 series lead, can take full control, that's a really dominant position for them to be in, and they've shown that they have the talent to be able to close that out. So, are they going to be able to get that dominant lead or is Winthrop going to be able to equalize? Well, the winner of game number two was... Winthrop University. They are going to take game number two. They're going to tie up this series at one apiece, and we've got a back and forth on our hands. This was a really close game for basically the entirety of the game. There was some really, really good execution down the stretch for Winthrop. A couple of players that I really want to give big shout outs, but honestly, none of the 10 players in this game individually played horrible. There was nobody that just completely ran it and had a really bad game and just wasn't really able to get anything done. There were positives and negatives for both of these teams. Blue Otter, as is kind of usual with them, were able to get a pretty decent early game lead, but it never really felt like they were able to take that lead and extend it into something that was truly sustainable. Like, as much as I say that Blue Otter had a lead, for a lot of this game, it just felt entirely even with the 2k gold lead on Blue Otter's side, and then eventually Winthrop just got stronger, because I mean... Look at their comp. Like, of course, they ended up getting stronger in the back half of this game. A lot to like, though, about this game for Winthrop, and I'm really excited to talk about it. Player of the game, to me, is very obvious. It's gonna go to Darkwings in the mid lane. I think a lot of people might give this to Denethor in the top lane, and, and he had a great game. Trust me, like, I understand some of those late-game team fights. He really started to get the ball rolling. I think he's a big reason why that gold lead started to shrink in the later half of this game, but he doesn't get the opportunity to do as much as he does in this game without Darkwings, who was awesome on the Azir. I didn't mention Darkwings all that much in the preview, mostly because I just think that Winnie and Aaron have been more noticeable for this team, but Darkwings, as you guys know, if you followed the channel for a while, somebody that I talked really highly about for the past, like, two or so years, at this level. I've been really in on him as a player. He's developed more and more into that feast or famine type of mid laner. He came into the league as somebody that I thought was rather consistent, really didn't have a lot of those horrible games. And then last year, I think something kind of flipped in his head where he's like, I have to be the carry. And, you know, I think he slowly started to move back to a more consistent stage over the course of this year. That's not to say that all of the best performances have gone out the window. I still think there are really good games from Darkwings. I just don't think it's been nearly as noteworthy as maybe like last year was in terms of, oh, he's either like 21 and 5, or he's like 0, 10, and, and 18, right? Like, there's not as much of a disparity, in my opinion, this year, and I think that that is a good thing overall for the team, and when you're playing this game where you just want to scale it out, where it's going 45 plus minutes, and you're Azir, you have to be good. Like, you have to be one of the best players in the game, and he was, so credit to him. Denethor, of course, the other player that deserves a big shout out here on the Camille. Um, he was just awesome. Like, this is a great bounce back after kind of a rough game number one. I really want to see him on more of these divers. It really does feel like the comfort zone for him, as much as I think Champ 
champions like Rumble are really strong right now. Putting them on Camille, putting them on something like Jax, I think could just be a, an easy way to win a lot of games because he clearly feels a lot more comfortable, or at least it, it seems like he's a lot more comfortable on these more aggressive champions. I think Aaron looked really good in some of the late game team fights. I continue to be a very big fan of Jin as a champion, and he was doing some damage. Chucky's looked really good here in game number two when he was also solid. I don't think he was perfect. I think Music definitely had the upper hand early, but that's kind of how the Lilia Maokai matchup should go as long as the Lilia is trying. So Winthrop looking really solid, like being able to hold on, understanding that their team scales infinitely well into the back half of this game and just being able to close it out. And then for Otter on the other side, I can't even really like be too frustrated with this loss because they kind of did the thing that they've done all year long, which is get these small early game leads. And unless it's like a four or 5k lead, it's not quite as easy for them to close it out. The early games just are so good that it almost overshadows the fact that they're not like that good in the later half of the game, or at least not clinical. They're good in that part of the game. You don't get to the number five seed if you're not, but it's just the consistency with this team. And that kind of came back into play here, just allowing Winthrop to stick around long enough for their comp to get online, which really just shouldn't have happened for a lot of this game. Dud of the game is basically impossible. I mean, all five members have outplayed fine for Blue Water, and all of them had both positive and negative moments. I am unfortunately going to give it to Rovex. Just kind of the way it goes with support sometimes is when you're on the losing side, you look kind of useless. In some of the late game fights, there was just nothing Leona could do the moment that the Azir plus Camille duo ended up getting online because he would melt instantly in a lot of these fights, and that's really just bad for the Leona. But Samakin getting caught out a lot in the later half of the game was definitely probably the most noticeable negative plays that happened to Blue Blue Water. He just was a big reason why they were in the game. He was top damage for the team. I didn't feel justified giving him dead of the game, but I do think some of his more negative plays were actually probably the most consequentially bad plays for Blue Water, but he was so good in game one. You know, Samakin's been so good over the course of this split. You know, Levitate needed to probably be a little bit more active. The Jin was definitely more valuable than the Ash in the back half of this game. Music and Quacker were fine, but again, not game breakers. Blue Water just needs to be able to stress their leads a bit more. If they can do that, they're going to dominate this series, and they're going to be able to bounce back. But Winthrop now has some confidence, and they do have a game plan. If they can get to that later half of the game, they are much better, at least in my opinion, in these front-to-back 5v5s, as I think we've kind of seen. So, how is this going to play out? Well, as you guys know, I think Game 3 with a 1-1 tied series is the most important game of the entire series. Winning this sets, winning this sets you up really well moving forward, and... I really think it's important to be able to stay on the scoreboard to be able to maintain that consistency. So who's going to be able to take it? Well, the winner of game number three was... Blue Otter. They are going to take game number three. They're going to go back up in this series two to one. And this is the Blue Otter we saw in game one, where when they are able to get, you know, a pretty sizable, I guess, foothold in the game, they're able to win it. But this wasn't this early game masterclass. They actually weren't in a phenomenal position coming out of the early game. They certainly weren't in a bad position, but it wasn't over over coming out of the early game like it can sometimes be with Blue Otter. They just were able to hold on and honestly use a lot of the tools at their disposal better than and Winthrop was able to use theirs, and they walk out of this with a win. I think Blue Otter's uh, comp is a little bit more scuffed in terms of draft, not because I think that it's bad by any means. I think these champions are strong, but Winthrop's is just very concise. It's very clear what their win condition is. You've got Orn, Ivern, Tristana. Like, it is very, you know, clear what they want to play through, but Blue Otter had to deal with a few more things in the early game, and they end up getting to a point where every champion's unique strengths end up really mattering down the stretch, and that feels like such a prophetic way to talk about it, but genuinely, like, every, ch every champion and kind of did their thing in this game, and that's really cool to see. Player of the game for me pretty obviously is going to go to Rovex. I didn't have to think about this all that much. This was an amazing bard game from Rovex, and this is kind of recompense for me giving him done of the game in game number two that he really did not deserve. Um, this bard game was awesome. Those ultimates from bard can sometimes be very difficult to land in high-pressure situations in, you know, a, in a playoff format, right? Like, you're, the pressure is already so high, and there is a real opportunity for you to be able to grief your team with bard ults, and so so when you do land good ones, then all of a sudden it's like, wow, this guy's the best in the world. Um, Rovex has been awesome for a lot of this split, and the Bard continued to look amazing in this game. This is a champion that honestly has looked really good every single time it's been played at any level. I'm really surprised it doesn't have more play right now, especially because it feels like a lot of the engagers are just you know, either you get ahead early and you win or you, you get behind and you lose, right? And so something like Bard, I think, can be very Feast or Famine, but it kind of fits into the meta at the current moment. I think Music is justifiably getting a lot of praise for this game as well. My only concern is that he really didn't play well in the early game. 
got a bit outplayed, I would say, on the other side of this matchup, but the back half of this game, he was invaluable. I mean, he was landing ultimates, and more notably, he was just blocking CC and, and doing his job as a frontline tank to be able to set up, you know, the Talia and the Ezreal to do as much damage as possible. Bard as well, honestly, to an extent with that damage. So, music played well. I thought Quacker was very valuable in this game on the Mordekaiser. You know, that champion just looks good basically every time it's played. I, I uh, you know, I tweeted this out a couple of days ago, probably a week ago at this point, but I'm just not a huge fan of Mordekaiser as a champion. Um, that's not to say that I don't think it's good. I think it's very good. I just think it's a bit boring to watch as a as a viewer, but Quacker played it really well, and that ultimate is just always valuable. It's the best ability in the game, arguably. Uh, Samakin and Levitate were also very good. Samakin's damage was very good this game, and he continues to be great on things that move, like Talia. Levitate was solid on Ezreal, but overall, Blue Otter playing to the strengths of their comp just better than Winthrop was able to play to theirs, and you know, I feel bad, but Winthrop just wasn't really able to do much in the mid-game here. It really felt like a lot of their easy-to-execute engages ended up kind of falling apart part, and a lot of that was just not putting the gas on the pressure that they were able to create in the early game. Dud of the game for me is going to go to Winnie. Ivern is one of those champions that can be super busted and very difficult to break through, especially, like, looking at Blue Otter's comp, like, they don't exactly have the highest damage comp in the world, unless, you know, Talia and Ezreal are in a really good spot. Like, Ivern could potentially be a massive issue this game to try to break through things like Orn on the front line, or to keep Tristana, you know, safe when she's playing really aggressive, like Dark Wings is known to do, but the Ivern just ended up being useless in the later half of the game, and I think that that's definitely an indictment on the team and how they played around it, and because of that, Winnie is going to get dead of the game for me, but you can kind of point to multiple areas. I don't think Darkwings was particularly good in this game on the Tristana. It just felt like Samakin was constantly out roaming him and out pressuring him in the mid-game. You know, Denethor, Aaron, Chucky's, they were fine. Aaron and Chucky's in particular weren't the worst. I think that they definitely did some damage. That Varus can really hurt if you're in the right situation, but Winthrop looking outplayed here, and both of their losses have not necessarily looked all that good from them, and even their win was a really close game for a majority of it that they just were able to pull through in the later half. It's not looking super ideal for Winthrop at the moment, but of course, anything can happen, and winning game four is, is the start of that. If you win game four, now all of a sudden you have the momentum and the confidence going into a Silver Scrapes game five, but Blue Otter definitely with all of those things right now going into this game four, and so are they going to be able to shut the door and close this out, or is Winthrop going to be able to push us to that Silver Scrapes game number five? Well, the winner of game number four was... Blue Otter, they are going to take game number four. They're going to take this series three to one, and they will be moving on to the next round of the lower bracket here, and they have earned it. I feel bad for Winthrop. They put in a really good effort, I would say, across this series, but Blue Otter was definitely the better team. I think that they were much more clinical in terms of their execution. Their early game leads were really solid, even if this game wasn't a great example of that. Honestly, the back half of the series wasn't a great example of that, but Blue Otter was just really, really good in this series. Series, and they have now officially become the first promoted team to, I guess, win a playoff series like this and move on to round number two. Very impressed by Blue Otter. They have definitely earned that title over the course of this split. One thing I do want to note, I talked about this a bit before, but I wanted to wait until it was up on the screen to really go into depth on it. But this is full fearless, best of five. And what that essentially means is first three games, it's full fearless. Like if you pick a champion, if it is played on either side, it is out for both teams. It's not just fearless for your own team, like, you know, Hecarim and this game, or I guess Cassante in game number two or whatever. Once that's picked, it's out of the pool for both teams, but as you get into games four and five, the bans change. In game four, you only get your first three bans. The final two bans are no longer there. That's why they're not listed here, and then in game five, if it were to have gone to that, there would be no bans, because there would already be the 40 champions that are taken out of the pool from the first four games. I hope that is making sense. I'm sure you guys already know that. If you're watching this video, I don't think I would have to explain that, but I figured I'd at least go over it for those of you who maybe didn't know the format, but you know, Blue Otter, really, really good at playing around their win conditions in this game. Player of the game for me is going to go to Levitate in the bot lane on the Kai'Sa. I mean, genuinely, how do you give it to anybody else? This guy was just able to torch Winthrop in terms of these fights. The damage he was able to output is genuinely ridiculous. He gets his, like, belated Penta at the end of the game, his unofficial Penta at the end of the game, but... The fact that Kaisa made it to game four, in my opinion, is actually ridiculous. I think this champion is so strong right now, and you're able to really take over games so effortlessly. I get that it doesn't necessarily fit the style of Blue Otter, but when Kaisa is already, you know, getting a gold lead going into, like, the 15-minute mark against Caitlyn Lux, it's just over. Like, there's no way to play out the rest of that game. Rovex deserves a big shout-out as well. He was very much a contender for player of the series for me, but he didn't quite win it. Player of the series for me is gonna go to Samakin in the mid lane. It was between him and, and Music and Rovex. Like, those were the three 
three players that I was really considering, but I thought Samakin was the strongest for Blue Otter in this series, at least from my vantage perspective. I thought the Huey was obviously very good here in game number four, but the Talia in game three, and more specifically the Aurora in game number one, very standout. Like, he was just really consistent throughout all of these games. I think the only concern was the back half of the Corky game in game number two, but even then, the, the first part, the first half of that game was really good from him, and so you feel very good about how Samakin is playing. He's been the probably most consistent player across the entire split for them, even if Levitate has probably been a bit better down the stretch in these important moments where they've started to develop a lot. I think Samakin has been excellent. Quacker going 2-0-20 on Shen. You know, Shen is really not something we're seeing all that much. I don't think Shen is unplayable by any means. I think there are tanks that do a slightly better job, you know, side laners, you know, <laughs> pseudo bruisers that do a slightly better job right now. Shen just falls into this weird limbo state sometimes, but I think generally Quacker made it look very good in this game. The Scion very much did not work R5 on the other side. Even Hecarim looked solid in this game, although he did go a bit too deep a couple of times, but Blue Otter just looking really good. They were definitely better than Winthrop, and they proved that here today. For Winthrop, it's a sad way for your split to end. Obviously, being eliminated from the playoffs with a loss here is certainly not ideal, but Still, to be able to stay in the NACL, I think, is definitely an accomplishment for this team. A lot of people, me included, were not expecting this team to be top eight going into the split. And so the fact that they made playoffs, even if they weren't really able to do much in the playoffs, I still think is a big accomplishment. I think Aaron and Chucky's were really interesting as a duo in this series. We'll see if that continues to be something that maybe these two want to play for moving forward. Obviously, in the NACL, it's likely there's going to be a lot of roster turnover going into next year, but we'll have to end up seeing how that works out. Dead of the game, unfortunately, for me, is going to go to Winnie once again here on the Jarvan. You know, when you're the diver, when you're the one that has to set up a lot of these plays and your team is really far behind, especially after like the 10 minute mark where things really blew up for Blue Otter, then it's just a lot more difficult to end up playing that out. I don't think Winnie was particularly good in this series, but it wasn't just him. I don't think Denethor played particularly well outside of that great Camille game. In game two, you could say similar things about Dark Wings in the mid lane. I think outside of game two, there were some real concerns about the gameplay here. But again, Winthrop has secured their spot in the NACL going into next year. So long as there isn't some gigantic format change in tier two. You never really know what's going to happen because of everything that's going on. But, um, you know, we've got a slot opening up with the team potentially moving up into the LCS. So we'll see what happens. But Winthrop very likely retaining their spot regardless of this loss here. And, and they're going to be happy with that, I think, continuing to build their roster up. We saw what happened with Maryville last year where it was a team that was really struggling in year one, but they were able to hang on, requalify for the NACL. And then this year, they've turned into a powerhouse. Maybe Winthrop can do that in 2025. But for Blue it's 2024. Like, they are not an underdog anymore by any means. This team has to be taken seriously against whoever they're facing. They play the winner of the series that we're going to cover next and the series that we're going to cover last in this video, and so we're not done with Blue Otter quite yet for the video, but they looked amazing here in the first series, and if they can play anything like they did here, it's going to be a pretty easy cakewalk into top five, top four territory. But then moving on to our second series of the video, and it's our second of these lower bracket round one series. And this one was a little bit more interesting on paper for me because both of these teams definitely did not expect to see themselves as a potential first out here in playoffs. It's the number six seeded Team Liquid Challengers taking on the number seven seeded Disguised. And uh, really the expectations for both of these rosters were so much higher than this, not only from themselves, but from me as, a, as an analyst. There's no way that either of these two teams should be sitting in this position. Now, Disguised, I think it's a little bit more understandable. They've gone through a bit of a roster shuffle over the course of the second half of the year. Their best player, at least in my opinion, in Tomo, was called up to 100 Thieves, got, you know, his contract bought out and ends up being a pivotal playoff piece for them moving forward. And so you have to go and try and find a replacement. CCG is not able to make playoffs. And I think they saw the writing on the wall when it came to that one. Manui ends up uh, coming back over here to DSG where he played, of course, in the spring split. It just hasn't been the same. And that's not entirely Manui's fault. Again, he's like the one player that I'm giving a lot of grace to, not only because he's new and I want to give him some time to like find his footing back with this team, but honestly, because it really hasn't entirely been his fault. There have been a couple of players over the course of this split that I just don't think have been particularly good for Disguised. I've been really disappointed by the outputs of Poom, who I think, you know, honestly, like I've never really been ridiculously high on him individually as a player, but I don't really think he's been all that good over the course of this split. Yukino, I don't think has been really all that transcendent as a jungler, especially because he's coming back after, you know, a couple MVP runs, his team gets, you know, cut, like there's no more 100 Thieves system in the NACL, and then, you know, he, he requalifies through CCG, comes here to DSG, and it just doesn't really end up working out. 
like tenacity has not been the number one or number two top laner like you would just kind of expect him to be like he was in the previous split in my opinion like there have been a lot of things that you can point to for DSG that have just not really been going super well but if it does click which it can really at any time this team can beat anybody as we saw in the playoffs last split in spring where this team was really struggling to find any momentum going into the playoffs and then they figured it out and they end up being one of the teams that goes the deepest in the playoffs just basically entirely through a lower bracket run or I guess it was an upper bracket getting that upset over Maryville in the spring split so Disguise certainly not a team that is unfamiliar with playoff heroics but they're going up against an Oregon a team that is like the definition of playoff heroics a team that you know conversationally becomes better as we get into the playoffs it's team liquid challengers and you know you just have to hope that that magic is still there spawn was obviously a big part of that the coach not the player although the player we'll get to he's also a playoff performer but you know spawn was a big part of that we're seeing that now in the LCS he just gets his players you know ready for a lot of these big playoff series and you have to wonder if that's going to be the same for TLC moving forward but they were able to do it in the spring split and it's not like you don't have some justifiable playoff performers on this roster spawn in the AD carry role kind of known as a playoff performer at the NACL level mostly for Dignitas in his previous stint but he was always the kind of player that you could count on in these big moments to step up and be really good for his team and I think that that should be considered for Team Liquid. Kim Down was a part of that as well but you know Romer arguably the most talented player in the NACL when it comes to just raw mechanics he's just not really been able to put it together all that consistently if you get a good series out of him. Team Liquid absolutely can win. Kiel is a player that I think has been probably their best player over the course of this split. Jenkins has had some really good moments over the course of this split. There still is a lot to like about Team Liquid and it's just hard for me to look at this team that has always done well in the playoffs that has always overperformed even when we've counted them out see a roster that I think is maybe one of their strongest in a while and say yeah they're not going to get it done they're going to be one of the first out that's my prediction that's the hard thing to do right I just I don't believe that for Team Liquid so they're my favorites coming into the series but again both of these teams have had some playoff heroics in the past so it's all about who steps up on the day so course we got to figure that out by going game by game and that means starting with game number one let's get into it the winner of game number one was team liquid challengers they are going to pick up the first game of this series they're going to go up one to nothing in this series and this was your typical let's not worry too much about early game let's make our comeback and let's make it simple team liquid game that you could ever see like this is one of the most formulaic comebacks I've ever seen and that's just kind of to the credit of team liquid it's not because DSG played horrible although I think there certainly were some concerns in the back half of this game allowing team liquid to get in good positions to just win fights that they probably shouldn't have won but a lot of this credit is going to go to Team Liquid for making proper plays and really putting DSG in a position where they were kind of forced to give over this gigantic gold lead that they generated for themselves in the early game. Player of the game is pretty obviously going to go to spawn. For me, this guy could not miss an arrow throughout a majority of this game. You know, I think you can point out one or two maybe throughout it, but like basically every arrow he hit was consequential and they were able to follow up. And, and generally in a lot of the last fights of the game, like the pivotal ones, where it really came down to these teams are even in gold and Team Liquid really needs to step up. Spawn was in entirely untouched on the backline, doing a bunch of damage on Ash as well. This just was a fantastic performance from a very good AD carry. We talked about it before. I'm a big fan of Spawn. I think he's not the most flashy player in the world. He's not the most aggressive player in the world. He's cut from the same cloth as players like Teddy and Patrick, in my opinion. When you look at some of the other regions in terms of comparisons, he's not going to dominate you in laning phase. He's not going to be the most aggressive player in the world, but if you put him in a good position, he has the mechanics and the wherewithal to not screw that up and to be very consistent in in that regard and we saw that here he was kind of a playmaker for this team on the ash with those arrows and so really great game by Spawn. Want to give a big shout out to Kim Down as well. It's a lot harder for the Ash to play this game with that low mobility when you've got a Corky or a Renekton or a Leona trying to dive on top of you and so Kim Down's role becomes infinitely more valuable this game just to make sure Ash is in a good spot the moment that she starts having a ton of gold and a ton of resources so big credit to Kim Down. Keel was also very good in this game on the Lilia. Obviously gets the Baron steal at the end of the game that really ends up I guess being consequential. It doesn't really matter as long as they end up winning the fight but who knows maybe that really helped them win in the fight. Either way, it's still really big for Kiel to be able to get it. And I think generally his tempo in the back half of this game, even though he wasn't great early on, was really important towards TL success. Jenkins did a billion damage. I think he was close to topping the damage charts. He might have even topped the damage charts. I don't even remember. And then Romer, of course, was solid on the Zeri, but probably the most forgettable piece on this team. Uh, that's a good sign because Romer is so important typically to their success. So really nice game one from Team Liquid playing towards their win conditions, even when fr playing from behind. And then for DSG, 
you know, I just, you gotta feel a bit frustrated because obviously you should have won this game, but how much of it was really DSG like throwing away the lead and how much of it was Team Liquid just like grabbing it back? I think a lot of the aggression this game was on the blue side was for Team Liquid and DSG just couldn't quite answer that. Their early game was good. They were able to get young quite a bit of gold on this Quirky and that really should have been the end of the story. Like Yukino had a really strong early game here on the Zyra and the moment that those two as a duo start spiraling a bit out of control, there really shouldn't be a lot of ways to answer if you're Team Liquid but the door was open and they ended up taking it. I think Young was very good in the back half of the game. Tenacity was doing quite a bit, especially in the mid game. You know, they were kind of playing around that top side with Yukino, but the bot lane never really appeared in this game. They just weren't all that relevant. Manui's actually going to get my dud of the game, regardless of the fact that I don't think he made any critical errors. I just think he was the one player in the game that I was like, well, you got to do more. Like, you got to do a, a decent amount of damage. You got to be able to step up in some of these fights, especially in the back half of this game when gold is starting to equalize. Those bullet times become more and more relevant. And it felt like Poom wasn't setting them up particularly well, but Manui was also just not following through on them particularly well. I don't think it's the worst dud of the game I've ever given out, but it certainly wasn't one of those performances that I feel particularly good about if I'm looking at, you know, what, what this bot lane needs to be. I think Team Liquid's bot lane was just straight up better on the other side here. Poom, of course, needs to get some credit for not setting up a lot of those bullet time plays, those wombo combos. They played so much for the top side of the map that bot lane ended up just falling so far behind that there really was no answer. And again, I think Yukino is also the other player. Like, he was great in the early game. He had a clear idea, clear plan to try to get his solo laners ahead. But when that didn't work and when, you know, Team Liquid started to come back into the game, he was just way too over eager. And in a lot of situations, just wasn't in the right position. And so, you know, Team Liquid, I want to give them a lot of credit for this win, but DSG needs to be better at being able to close things out because this should have been a DSG win and it just wasn't. So that's game number one. You know, it's definitely an intriguing one. You don't want to go down 0-2 to a team like Team Liquid Challengers with that playoff buff. That's a death sentence. It's going to be very difficult to win three games in a row against them. So a big game here for DSG. Can they take it or is Team Liquid going to take that dominant 2-0 series lead? Well, the winner of game number two was... Team Liquid Challengers, they are going to take game number two. They're going to go up in this series two to nothing, and this is a dominant way to start, although the games do feel a bit chaotic. I mean, this one going 50 minutes, the first one I think going like 35. These aren't like dominating games. These aren't Team Liquid obliterating DSG from start to finish, but it all really comes down to late game execution, and right now the late game execution is very much in favor of Team Liquid. This is slightly against the grain in terms of what Team Liquid has been over the course of this year up until this point they've been a good team at you know being able to skill check a lot of the teams they're going into Romer is very good at that Keel is very good at that even Jenkins is very good at that but they haven't been able to piece together a lot of like clean wins especially in the later half of the game usually if they're going in relatively neutral it's not actually that great of a look for them and honestly there were times in this game where it kind of felt like that was going to be the case once again they get this pretty strong early game and mid game lead that they're just not able to close out and it just DSG starts climbing back and back and back and then eventually the smolder gets online and you can no longer lose the game like it is impossible at that point to lose fights but team liquid still needs more clinical execution to me if they want to be the team that ends up competing where i think they kind of expect themselves to be competing at least at the moment player of the game is once again gonna go to spawn for me i think a lot of people are gonna give this one to romer in the mid lane on the leblanc I thought he played well. I'm certainly not going to try to take anything away from him in the early game because the early game was really solid. And if you're talking about the reason that TL was able to establish their pressure in the game to begin with, it's almost entirely through this LeBlanc and almost entirely through Romer's very strong play. But the later half of the game, he was just getting caught like left and right. Like it truly was not a very good back half of the game for Romer and Spawn was integral towards winning this game at the end of the day. And so for a slightly more complete performance, I'm giving this to Spawn. But if you wanted to give it to Romer, it should should be one of those two. But again, Spawn was the damage carry in the back half. Smolder ended up getting online and just being able to tear through DSG, not really having a ton of options. DSG goes for a comp that I think is relatively comfortable for them. Of course, the Ziggs in the bot lane certainly something to stand out, but uh, Ziggs plus Tristana is something that this team really has like to go towards in a lot of different situations. I think something like the Udir for Tenacity in the top lane is also generally fine, but Spawn just gets online. Again, even with DSG trying to crawl their way back into this game, so long as the Smolder is there, it feels 
pretty inevitable that Team Liquid is going to be able to take it. I want to give a big shout out to everybody else on this team as well. It wasn't just like a two-man effort. I think Jenkins, Keel, and Kim Down all had their moments as well. Kim Down with a couple of great engages, especially in the back half to set up some things to really make it a lot easier for Smolder to play. I thought Keel was excellent in terms of his pathing throughout this game. Skarner can sometimes have a bit of a, a big impact in some of these fights, but Maokai was always there to try and equalize things in terms of, you know, creation opportunities. And then Jenkins was really solid on the Aatrox, just being a little bit more consistent in the back half of the game as opposed to the Udyr on the other side of this matchup. So a lot of positives for Team Liquid, but again, it kind of comes down to the carry roles really being clinical in the back half of the game. And if they're getting that, that's really the big missing piece that they have been looking for for basically the entire split, the entire year, really. And then for DSG, being down 0-2 in this series is certainly not ideal. Having to win three games in a row against Team Liquid is a very bad place to be because Team Liquid is just a really good team. And honestly, it's really hard to identify major weaknesses or major problems with this team because, again, very similar to kind of what I talked about with Team Liquid, there are players that have really big positives and then also really big negatives in the same game. I think Yukino and Poom continue to be the most polarizing players on the team for me. Yukino's really good plays on the Skarner look great and, you know, keeping the team in the game was huge, but also he wasn't particularly valuable in some of those like last fights of the game. I think very similarly of Poom, I think the Nautilus was key in establishing pressure in the mid game and really creating opportunities early on, but just really wasn't all that useful after that. Unfortunately, that means dead of the game is going to have to go to Young in the mid lane. I don't even really feel all that strongly about this again, very similarly to how I talked about Rovex in game two of the previous series. It just feels wrong to give someone like Young dead of the game for his performance, but Romer getting so far ahead in the early game and being able to just kind of move around the map and be more valuable in that area was what kind of caused Team Liquid to start to spiral the game out of control in the first place. And so that's really the only thing that I have to latch on to for Dead of the Game. If you guys want to give it to Tenacity on the Udyr because that champion just kind of fell off as the game continued to go along, I think that that's fine. Manui also wasn't nearly as valuable on the Ziggs as we've seen with some of the other teams that have picked him up in the past. And so there are options here. Hell, you could even give it to Yukino or Poom for some of those late fights. I think that that's also fair, but I just didn't think it was valuable on them. And again, it really comes down to Romer just getting really far ahead on the LeBlanc for the reason that Young ends up getting dud of the game here. But DSG with their backs up against the wall. No other way to really put that. They are in a position where they have to win. If they lose any game the rest of this series, they are eliminated from playoffs. And I think their hope right now is just to stay alive as long as possible to get themselves into a spot where they can even try to regain some confidence. And for Team Liquid, you kind of want to close this out in a clean sweep. If you can bounce back from that round one loss by just kind of destroying DSG, that's definitely going to be a bit of a confidence booster. But are they going to be able to close it out in three? Or is DSG going to stay alive for at the very least one more game? Well, the winner of game number three was... DSG. They are going to take game number three. They're going to stay alive in this series by picking up their first win. And uh, yeah, this was a pretty important one for them to get. Obviously, lose this and your playoffs are over. Your back is still very much up against the wall in this series, but at least you have some hope, some life. And honestly, this was probably the most dominant game of the series, at least for one team or the other. Um, that's really good to see from DSG. They were able to do some interesting things in the early game through the middle of the map, as is kind of traditional traditional in this current meta, but not really in the way that you would expect. Traditionally, you play through the middle of the map because that's where you have this like AD carry, like Marksman hyper carry, something like a Zeri or a Tristana or, you know, even a, a Smolder, like even a Zir kind of fits that idea of just wanting to play through something that can scale really effortlessly as this big damage carry into the late game. But they have the Orianna and they said, screw it, we can just turn her into that if we really want to do that. And Young was certainly good enough in this game to do that, even if they were struggling on the top side early. So let's talk about it. Player of the game very obviously is going to go to Young. I didn't have to think about this at all. This guy was awesome in game number three. This is very similar to that Rovex game number three player of the game I gave in the previous series where Young didn't particularly deserve dead of the game in that second one, but he definitely deserved it here in the uh, third one, the player of the game in the third one, and this is kind of recompense for that, if you will. So credit to Young. Usually you don't see Orianna in this meta just take over in terms of damage. It's one of the reasons that I consider her a bit of a bait pick at the current moment. Like, yes, a lot of mid lane are good at her and she's gonna be meta like just regardless of the state that she's in at the current moment but especially after some of the buffs that she got on the recent patch I think she's in a position where she can actually do some damage 
And I do think that there is a situation where Oriana becomes more valuable than maybe some of the Azirs or, or things of that nature, the Syndras, that we're seeing in a similar vein just because she offers significantly more utility if she can't offer the damage as well. So Young was awesome as the primary carry this game, but Yukino deserves a lot of credit for setting that up as well. You know, I'm not the biggest Yukino fan in the world from what we've seen so far in 2024, but I can't deny that he's actually been very important to this team in this series so far. You know, keeping them alive in the first couple of games, you know, trying to get them in it with the Skarner in particular in game two, but really the Vi, like creating opportunities all the time here in game number three. Really good stuff from him. Manui and Poom were also solid. Tenacity, I mean, really embodied his own name in this game. He goes 0-4 to start off this one and just gets obliterated early on by the Olaf because of all the pressure that Kiel ends up putting with the Warwick in the top lane. By the way, Warwick top, very fun. Um, but he ends up going deathless the rest of the game, goes 4-0-5 over the back half and looks amazing. Just exactly what you want to see out of your top lane or let them put resources into you and, uh, uh, be useful anyways. That's kind of the dream. So pretty good game by DSG and, and not a good game at all really by Team Liquid. They did have an idea early on and that was to try and shut down Tenacity. They wanted to try to get Jenkins really fed on this Warwick to just see if he could drain tank to like take over the game, like be unkillable in the back half so long as they had anything coming out of the Azir or the Ezreal and you have, you've got the Ivern to potentially throw shields on him. Like there is a clear idea here, but I think it is a bit separated, right? If you're going to draft something like the Poppy or even the Azir in the mid lane, having something like Ivern in the jungle just leads to these situations where a lot of times you just don't have the damage. You don't have the like hyper carry potential to be able to break through. Now, if Azir was super fed or if Spawn was in this like amazing position, perhaps you could make the argument that that was going to be possible. But to then put a lot of your time and effort into ganking for the Warwick in the top lane, it just feels kind of misguided in my opinion. Maybe you're looking at DSG and seeing like a lack of damage, quote unquote, but I, I don't really see that. Um, I don't really see this inability to break through Warwick if he's in a good spot kind of mentality. So uh, I don't think Team Liquid necessarily had the best game plan for their individual draft in this game. And then, you know, I certainly don't think the champions ended up working out. Whether or not you want to give this dud of the game to Romer or Kim Down, I think it should go to one of those two. I'm going to give it to Kim Down. The Poppy did generally nothing throughout this game. And if you're going to pick it in the support position, you want it to be impactful both early and in the mid game. And Young, was just way too valuable to really ever have the poppy be anything other than just like a target dummy on the other side of this matchup, which is never ideal. And then Romer's the other player that you got to shout out for just not being all that useful. Young got really far ahead of him in the early game on this Orianna, and the damage coming in from the Azir just wasn't there. And again, because Team Liquid put so much time and effort into trying to make sure this Warwick was in a good spot, all of a sudden this Azir is now behind and you don't really have a way to win 5v5s in the back half of the game. And so just some direction problems, in my opinion, from Team Liquid. Things that that I think they can address, things that I think they can fix, but DSG with the best game that anybody's probably played so far here in game number three, if they can carry that momentum into game four, well, now all of a sudden we got a series on our hands. Their back is very much still up against the wall. It still is like a win or go home situation for them, but a lot more confidence than before, but Team Liquid definitely going to be coming into this game looking to show that game three was a bit of an outlier. If they can close it out here in four, they're definitely going to be feeling confident going into our final series of the video, but is Team Liquid going to be able to close it out, or is DSG DSG going to push us to a Silver Scrapes game number five and keep the reverse sweep hopes alive. Well, the winner of game number four was... DSG. They are going to take game number four. They're going to even up the series at two apiece, and the reverse sweep is very much in play right now as we head into a Silver Scrapes game number five. I am very excited to see how this ends up going because DSG in the back half of this series has honestly just looked like the better team. Team Liquid has had some interesting pieces, but they go, relatively speaking, almost entirely to comfort in this game. Things like Akali mid, Jarvan in the jungle, even Jenkins has been playing a lot of Aurora, and so you're, you're going to a lot of these picks that have kind of worked for you over the course of this year, but this weird lingering cloud over this organization so far, this split where they've just not been able to close out series, regardless of whether or not they're up early on, and it is, is it just continues to linger over them, and, and I don't really know what to say at this point. This is not a good look. DSG is looking great, and they've got all of the confidence and momentum in the world right now, heading out of game number four, because this was a great look for them. Player of the game for me is 
very narrowly going to go to Manui. I want to give a huge shout out to Tenacity. We'll talk about him in just a second on the Rumble, but Manui was awesome in this game on the Kalista. Was able to get, I think, like five or six tower plates early on in the game. Was able to completely take over some of these late game team fights in terms of the damage he was putting out. He had some amazing ultimates on Poom throughout this game as well to be able to set up plays for the Yasuo or even for the Rumble to be able to take advantage of. Generally, just a great game from Anui, and they've really been... I'm not going to say waiting on this because I think generally speaking, this team should be able to win regardless of if Manui is in like perfect form with this brand new team. But the fact that he is starting to level up, that does add a new wrinkle, a new layer to DSG. If he's going to be a really good AD carry for this team, that could completely unlock what their ability in the rest of this playoffs looks like if they are able to win this game number five. And more importantly, obviously, it should unlock a lot of more options in this game five now that we have 40 champions off the board. So... Big ups to Manui. I thought he looked really, really awesome in this game on the Kalista. Tenacity, of course, the other player that I considered. I think he led the entire game in damage, although Jenkins, I think, came very close on the Aurora. But Tenacity was able to do a ton. They were fighting constantly on the top side of the map. He ends up getting super fed in some of these late fights and is just able to incinerate people. This is Tenacity's best game in a while, and they were really kind of waiting on it. Yukino, I thought, was really good here on the Sedge as a setup man, as a facilitator for the rest of this team. I actually think he's been really good in this series so far. Poom was good on the Braum, again, playing really aggressive because of the Kalista getting to get thrown in there. Young got to follow up on a few of those with Yasuo Ultimates. It's just a really nice, complete game for DSG. Again, maybe there were some ups and downs. They weren't perfect in the early game, but look at this comp. So long as Manui is actually doing well, which he was, yeah, it's eventually going to turn around for them, and that's exactly what happened. And then for Team Liquid on the other side, it's just got to feel frustrating. Like, I can't imagine the mental pressure that is on these players right now because of, again, this lingering fear feeling over the org that they're just not able to close it out in these pivotal circumstances, it feels like that's applying once again, and that's really not an ideal circumstance or situation to be in. Dead of the game for me is going to go to Kim down on the Blitzcrank. The Blitz just didn't do anything throughout this game. There, was, there weren't really any plays that I was looking at and saying, well, Blitz completely changed the outlook of that. I mean, he landed hooks, but how many of them were like game-breaking? Just not a lot of them. The Blitzcrank didn't really feel all that effective as a champion, and especially because you're trying to set up so much here in the late game, they have a ton of squishies. You have a ton of good targets here, but the Braum and the Sedge were simply playing too well to be able to create opportunities for that Blitz to take over in the back half here. I want to give a shout out to Jenkins. Uh, he might have done the most damage in the game. I, I honestly don't know. Like, I, I would have to look at the numbers once again. Him and Tenacity were basically 1A, 1B. They were basically identical in terms of their damage numbers over the back half of this. But uh, this is the case that Aurora is broken. This is one of those games where Aurora is in the top lane against a champion that she doesn't get completely clobbered by in lane, at least in the 1v1. And she's able to kind of get to her power spikes pretty effortlessly and then just kind of really be a major nuisance in the side of DSG throughout the entirety of this game. Again, Aurora's biggest problem as a champion is that her, her laning phase is inconsistent, that she's not going to be all that good in the 1v1 matchup, but that is, a lot of that is alleviated in the top lane just because of the nature of the position. And so Jenkins looking really good, trying to take advantage of that champ, but she's gone now. No one can play Aurora the rest of the series. And so, you know, it opens up some options. You know, Keel needs to be better in the jungle. Honestly, like a lot of the tempo just wasn't there. Yukino has outplayed him for a lot of this series. Spawn was really taking over a lot of these games early on, but he's been taken off of the hyper carries and put on things like Varus that are supposed to help the Akali, and it's just not working out. Romer really has not taken over any game so far in the playoffs, and we're talking about a guy who might be the most mechanically talented player in the entire league, and we're kind of waiting for that big breakout performance. It's just not really been there so far for Team Liquid in these last two games. If they are going to avoid getting reverse swept, they have to go back to some of the things that were working for them, and they've got to stay mentally on track. I think the most important thing for them is they can't get down. They can't get discouraged, because that's going to eliminate them a lot faster than their gameplay they will. But for DSG, on the other side, massive victories, massive back-to-back -back victories for this team to stay alive. You just have to complete it now with the reverse sweep in game number five. Are they going to be able to do it, or is Team Liquid going to take this series after all? Well, the winner of game number five was... DSG. They are going to take game number five. They are going to take this series three to two and the reverse sweep has been achieved. It has been activated. DSG go from being zero to down to Team Liquid to winning the series and moving on to round number two. For Team Liquid, this has to feel horrible. For your split to end in such a way is certainly not ideal. We typically have at least one reverse sweep in the NACL playoffs, but almost always it happens to Manui. It feels like that's kind of been 
been the trend. We talk about, obviously, DSG last split getting reverse swept out of third place. We talk about Fear getting reverse swept out of the finals, like, a year, uh, like, last year. And now we talk about DSG being the one to complete the reverse sweep against Team Liquid. It's just a really fun set of circumstances, and they earned it. Team Liquid, obviously, that cloud above their head has only grown crazy large. I know this is the end of the year for them. There's not really anything to build upon going into, like, the rest of the year because they're not qualifying for any more games, but certainly it's got to feel rough to end your year off in a situation where you probably should be moving on to round number two. But again, just as a reminder, if you see no bans on the left-hand side, that's because we've reached game five of a full fearless draft. That means all 40 champions that have been played in this series up until this point are off the table, and there are no bans. The only bans are the 40 champions off the table. The only bans, I say. There are 40 champions that are unable to be played in this game, but DSG certainly made it work the further and further this series went. Player of the game and player of the series, very easy choice for me. It's going to go to Young in the mid lane. He was integral towards this team's success in the back half here. He was great in game three. He was great here in game number five on the Syndra. Just being able to find tempo and pressure in the game here through the middle of the map, I think, was by far the most important thing that DSG could have found. Romer had a rough one, we'll just say, in game number five here. Definitely was not able to, I guess, hold up his own end of the bargain against Young, who played really fantastic. But Young, the only member of this disguise team to have stayed after their championship in 2023. Uh, obviously, the team has kind of really evolved around him. It's very different than it was last year. But Young, kind of the holdover piece from that team, and he continues to be the one driving them forward. He was awesome, like truly the focal point for what they wanted to do. I do want to give a big shout out to basically everyone else on the team, Yukino and Manui in particular. I think had a very good second half of this series. Yukino was great at setting things up specifically for Young to be able to create that pressure in the middle of the map. I think they could have created it in other ways as well, but Yukino was kind of the driving force in the early game for making sure DSG was in good positions. Manui was very integral in some of these team fights. The moment that he started playing a lot more aggressive and with confidence, that's when things turned around. I know I've been a bit of a broken record on Manui. I feel like I've been saying this on the channel for two full years, but when Manui has confidence, when he's stepping into the those plays and really feeling good about the decisions he's making. He's genuinely one of the best AD carries in the NACL. The only times that he's really struggled is when, you know, his team around him is struggling and he perhaps starts to lose a bit of confidence and then he goes into subsequent series, maybe not trusting his gameplay and trusting his ability enough. I think when there is confidence and when there is that knowledge that, hey, I'm going to go out there and execute and I know I can do it. He's one of the better ADCs in the NACL, full stop. So, Great performance out of the middle of the map here. Tenacity was great after the four deaths on Olaf, essentially from the second half of Game 3 onwards. He was really important to this team. Poom, I thought, was really good in a lot of these laning phases, which is very important for DSG. It's just a really, really solid comeback. It couldn't have happened without all five members really stepping in and stepping up, and so you've just got to be excited and happy for this team. But for Team Liquid on the other side, man, this has got to suck. Like, again, mentally, I can't imagine the toll that this has to take on the players just because of the narrative around them for so much of this split, not only because they were expected to do better than this, but because the narrative was that they would throw away series at the last moment for you to get reverse swept out of the playoffs, not win a single playoff series. It's really just not an ideal set of circumstances, and I imagine that there are going to be some changes going into next year, as there will be for every single one of these NACL teams. It's just kind of how the league works, but a Romer is going to get my dead of the game here for Game 5. I'm going to be honest, my expectations for Romer were, you know, out of this world <laughs> going into the beginning of the year when Team Liquid picked him up in January. I felt very good about what he was going to be. In fact, I thought out of him and Quad, the two Korean imports in the mid lane in the offseason, I thought Romer was the one that was going to be better and just take over the league from what we saw from him on Hanwha Life Challengers. Again, as somebody who watches that league super regularly, I just, I saw it in Romer. The mechanics were there and you just thought you were going to be able to teach him to be a more well-rounded player. That has just not happened. He has honestly underperformed quite a bit over the course of this year. I think people are still hanging on to some of the good games, but there have been a lot of bad games. And even though he is a capable of doing damage and capable of being a primary carry, the consistency is just simply not there, and he's out of position quite a lot. I think Kiel was also not great down the stretch of this series. I think Yukino was definitely better than him in the jungle matchup. Kim down, I thought, had a really rough back half of this series. You know, Spawn didn't really get to do anything. This Nilo was entirely useless in Game 5. Jenkins tried his best, was definitely the best player for Team Liquid down the stretch in terms of damage because they were fighting so often on the top side of the map. I think, again, he was highest damage in the game on the Cassante, but... It just is what it is. Team Liquid's year is coming to an end with a loss in the series here, and DSG will be moving on. I'm, I'm excited for DSG, but we're not done talking about them yet. Their round two series is what we will talk about after this, and so uh, hold that button on DSG. We've still got a lot of thoughts on them. 
but there is no rest for the winners here as we move on to our lower bracket round number two matchups here, and it's the two winners from earlier on in the weekend. That means DSG has to play on back-to-back -back days. That means Blue Water has to play twice in one weekend. This is a lot of games, and it's going to take a lot of mental fortitude for one of these teams to come out on top. I've already talked about it. It's the number five seeded Blue Water taking on the number seven seeded Disguised, and the way that these two teams match up should be relatively obvious. Both of them really want to get early game leads. They do not want to be going into these late game team fights, you know, even like that would be really bad, I think, for both of them. And, and I don't really know how things would go in that circumstance. I think DSG is probably a team I would count on a bit more in like even neutral game states going into 5v5s. But I also think that Blue Water has a more consistent early game. And so I could see this series going either way. I think matchup wise, there are quite a few to point out that are very intriguing. I think Robex versus Poom is certainly one that I'm going to monitor because Robex has been so good for Blue Water and Poom was very good in the previous series at the end against Team Liquid to be able to get that reverse sweep to happen in the first place. I think if one of those supports ends up really, you know, performing well in a series like this, that could be a big tell. I think Samakin, Young, like that, that's another matchup that is definitely worth watching. Both of them getting player of the series in the previous series of the weekend for their respective team. Samakin, of course, a little bit more dominant in their wins, but Young, I mean, just looked amazing in, in the back half of that series, was entirely integral towards the success of DSG. And so, as much as I'd like to sit here and preview these teams in depth and give you their play styles, you just saw, you just watched what these two teams could do. You don't need a ton of previewing. Let's just get into the games. I don't want to waste you guys' time too much. We're already basically an hour into this video. I don't want to sit here and, you know, take up too much more. So let's get right into it. Let's start with game number one. The winner of game number one was... Blue Otter. They are going to take the first game of this series. They're going to go up one to nothing. I think a lot of people would consider them underdogs going into a series like this. I said that they probably shouldn't be considered that for the rest of this tournament. They are clearly one of the four to five best teams, you know, at worst, like I guess sixth best team in the league. And, you know, they are really a team that can beat anybody on any given day. And they've shown up here, at least in game one against Disguise, who I think from a name value perspective, were definitely favorites for a lot of people coming into this. But they got a lot of their picks that ended up working out for them, not only in the previous series, but throughout a lot of the regular season, most notably that Rakan in the support position. Rovex, as we talked about in the intro, he is going to get player of the game here for game number one. He has been awesome for Blue Water. He is just a really fun player to watch. Levitate success, again, has at times overshadowed just how good Rovex has been for Blue Water. And, and as a support, I think he's really grown into being one of the more interesting ones in the entire NA ecosystem as a whole moving into the future. I'm really excited to see the development that he could potentially continue to make moving forward, but this just continues to show that you can't give him Rakan. I get that it's full fearless. I get that this is a format where obviously he's not going to be able to play it again the rest of the series. Maybe it's good to get it out of the way in the first game and just not have to deal with it from that point onwards, but he obliterated you on this. Like, this was a great Rakan game, constantly all over the map in terms of engages, in terms of keeping his own teammates safe, in terms of pulling the trigger on things. He wasn't always the number one guy. Shout out to Quacker, who was very impatient in this game in a good way. Um, but Rovex just really, really clinical on a champion that has clearly become kind of his signature pick. Uh, also worth shouting out, uh, I guess basically everyone, but I guess I'll go Samakin next. I think the Aurora was probably the second most important champion in this game. The biggest concern with Aurora is her laning phase, especially especially in the mid lane, where I think a lot of the marksmen that are currently played there, like Corky, quite frankly, should be able to take advantage of her and should be able to make her life a lot more difficult early on. If she can get to those break points, she can deal a ridiculous amount of damage from two full screens away. And so you do have to be concerned about her, but Samakin just makes it look so much easier playing it early on in the game because he is so good in the 1v1s, because he is so willing to make these macro plays and to play for music and to play for Robex and to try to play with the rest of his team. It really accelerates the tempo and the pacing of that Aurora curve and it makes their mid game a lot stronger than it normally would be in a lot of other circumstances. So really good game from Samakin. Music I thought was great on the Maokai. Quacker was so aggressive in this game on the Olaf. They definitely tried to take care of that Renekton early on. You know, Tenacity ends up building this really greedy build and doesn't really have any survivability in the back half of the game. And man, did they continue to take advantage of that in team fights. But Quacker already got that gigantic lead in laning phase that you want to give credit to. And I've just talked about Levitate last. He did the most damage in the game. Like, how, why am I talking about him last. This guy was awesome. He got a quadra kill to close out the game in that final team fight. He looked amazing. Like, this was just a very good win for Blue Water, and I think this does kind of separate, like, Blue from DSG. Both of them looked better in their wins than they did in their losses in the previous series, but Blue Water was so much more clinical in terms of getting there. When they won, they won a lot harder than DSG did, and so I'm really excited to see if that's something that's going to continue here for Otter, but... 
For DSG, on the other side of this matchup, some positives and some negatives. I mean, mostly negatives. I think there was action at the very least in this game, and that's something that you can sometimes criticize DSG for, is they can sometimes be a little bit scared to pull the trigger. I think a lot of that has to do with just playing with a new roster that maybe isn't quite as comfortable communicating in the early game quite yet. But man, some of the decisions in this game were really puzzling, really questioning for me. Tenacity is going to get dud of the game in the top lane. This didn't really feel like a difficult award to give. I like Tenacity. I thought he was very important down the stretch for DSG in that series against Team Liquid, but this was not a great way to start off this series against Blue Otter. The Renekton just was so squishy, so killable throughout a lot of these, you know, pivotal moments. Obviously, not building Sterics is going to be kind of pointed out, but there are a lot of things in this spot that I think you could have done to allow the Renekton to be more useful, and instead, he was just playing like regular Renekton without any of the stats of regular Renekton, who is famously kind of a bit of a stat stick champion. As long as he's able to get his requisite numbers, he's going to be very difficult to kill in the later half of the game, even if he isn't quite as useful as he is in the early part. But if Tenacity doesn't have those numbers, then that champion is just going to blow up and be useless in a lot of these fights. And that ended up happening. I don't think Young played particularly well in this game on the Corky. You have to try to take advantage of the Aurora more than Young did in the early game. I think Poom, Minui, Yukino, like nobody really played excellent in this game. Blue Otter just kind of outplayed them basically in every single laning phase. They had a much clearer idea of their direction when they drafted this comp. And again, they executed it really well. So credit to Blue Otter, but it's not about Game one, it's about the entire series as a whole, and that means game number two is just as important. Tying up this series, pretty integral for DSG. They don't want to have to reverse sweep two series in a row. That is so much pressure, and that's the edge of danger that I just think is a little bit too far. But for Blue Otter, if you can get that 2-0 lead, you're going to feel pretty good. That's already a lot of confidence coming out of that first round. You could be getting even more if you're able to dominate DSG like that early on. So are they going to be able to get that lead, or is DSG going to be able to even up this series at one apiece? Well, the winner of game number number two was DSG. They are going to take game number two. They're going to tie up this series at one apiece, and I can't overstate just how important it was for DSG to come out and have a game like this where they just control all the tempo, where they can kind of do whatever they want and actually tie up the series here. Going down 0-2, obviously, it's not a death sentence as we saw in the previous series from DSG, but two reverse sweeps in a row on back-to-back -back days, like, that would just be a lot. Like, that is a lot mentally for these players and, you know, for this team, and you just can't really ask that of them. I think winning this game too was of paramount importance for their continuation in the playoffs here. For Blue Water, you know, definitely not quite what they envisioned when they drafted this comp. I believe you've got the Malphite and that's clearly the direction they wanted to go in as this like big setup, almost Wombo Combo-esque type of thing here. You could potentially hit one layer of CC. If you hit like a Lux Binding or an Ash Arrow, you could combo that into Malphite Ultimate. You can combo it into the other CCs. You can get Viego resets and then hopefully just start to take over fights in that way. I could definitely see the idea idea behind what they were looking for here, but it just didn't end up working out. I think the way that they wanted it to, this Malphite got dove and put behind really early on into the game, and he was basically irrelevant. We'll talk about that. And a lot of that success should go to DSG. I want to give player of the game to Tenacity on the top side here for DSG, because the Kennen was the one that was just incinerating, obliterating, uh, destroying, shocking. What's like the electric term I can use? Um, if I, like whatever, whatever fun little term you want to use here. He was the one destroying Blue Otter on the other side of this matchup. Tenacity was excellent on the Kennen. This is the exact kind of performance on a champion like Kennen that reminds you of just how strong this champion can be. If you do get resources in the early game, Kennen actually turns into a major nuisance to try to play from behind into, and I think that's what a lot of teams over in the East have honestly kind of forgotten. There's a reason Kennen looks so bad in, in the LCK in particular, and it's because he's often just like, okay, well, he's going to go up topside. He's going to be able to, you know, at least do well in the 1v1, depending on who he's going into, and he's going to be useful in the late game. We don't have to put a lot of these resources into him, but he is a champion that when you do put resources into him, when you are trying to play around the Kennen, he actually is going to be able to pay that back out pretty heavily. In fact, the, the damage that Kennen can do in the late game, it's absurd. Obviously, we know him for the utility. We know that he's going to deal damage no matter what, but when it really goes off, like when Kennen really starts to take over a game, it's like unstoppable. There's really no easy way to deal with him. Exhaust is just not enough in a lot of those instances. And so, you gotta give a lot of credit to Tenacity for getting ahead, but give credit to Yukino as well for getting him ahead. It wasn't just Yukino. Obviously, Tenacity had a lot to do with it, but Yukino's pathing definitely created a lot of opportunities here for DSG. 
And this kind of carries over the idea of what we were seeing last uh, last series as well in round number one, where Yukino stepping up and being someone that like really controls the tempo of the game really is consequential for DSG. When they can play through his plays rather than reacting to the plays of the other side, they are much more clinical as a team. I think Young, Minui, Poom, they all looked good here. They were all really solid, but a lot of the strengths in this game were from the top side of the map, and so I want to give them credit for that. But for Blue Otter on the other side, you know, some ups and downs, definitely some ups and downs. I think it's very easy to point to topside as something that just didn't work out in this game. I really like Malphite as a champion in the meta right now. I think he creates a lot more than he is given credit for. I think he's quite good as a counterpick to a lot of the other very good top laners at the current moment, but Quacker is just not the kind of player that I think you are going to get the most out of Malphite with. Malphite very much a setup kind of champion for the rest of the team. He's not someone that really wants to get a lot of resources early. He's not really someone that you want to play for in fights. He's not really even the go button in a lot of these situations. If he is, is, then you're just kind of hoping and praying that you have enough follow-up to be able to make it work. Oftentimes the Ash Arrow is the go button, at least in terms of what I'm expecting in a comp like this, and that's just not really where Quacker thrives. The reason he looks so good on Olaf and not so good on the Malphite is because he has the go button himself on the Olaf. Like, he can just run in and, and just start to start things. He can be really aggressive in the 1v1. It just didn't really happen here. That being said, you know, him getting put behind so early, getting dove at level 5 to really delay his level 6 was absolutely disastrous for him and for his game, and it probably lost him the game. As much as we talk about some of the other things potentially going wrong, the R5 Malphite really was just more of a gameplay diff than it was a draft diff. I also want to shout out Levitate and Rovex. Like, Levitate didn't do anything in this game on the Ash. 5 and 2 is indicative of just how, like, irrelevant he was for a majority of this game. Anui and Poom were way more active on the map. Rovex really didn't get to do anything on the Alistair either. You know, it's not like Music was able to take over and get these resets and win some of these fights on Viego. Samakin, probably the only player with any gold on the Lux, but a lot of the gold was kind of useless for a lot of the mid game and so really not a lot of positives to say about Blue Otter in game two but we've traded good games we've traded some dominating performances back to back we're going into game three tied up at one apiece this is as I've said multiple times the most important game of the series in my eyes if you're able to win game three well now you've only got to win one of the final two much easier than having to win both of the final two so a very important game number three for both of these teams but only one can take it who will it be well the winner of game number three was Blue Otter. They are going to take game number three. They're going to go back up in this series two to one. And this is looking like a pretty familiar formula for Blue Otter moving into round number two here as they are back up after game number three. This team just continues to find win conditions, even in comps where I think it would be more difficult than the opposition. I think DSG's comp is a lot easier to execute as long as they don't completely shit the bed in the early game. Unfortunately for DSG, their early game just wasn't particularly good here and you allowed Rumble Kaisa, Skarner to get online and become a bit of a nuisance in the back half of this game. And then all of a sudden your Wombo combo that at first kind of looks at least decently difficult to set up and make work at a high level um, really ends up working very easily and actually becomes very simple to execute. So credit to Blue Otter for finding their win condition in that avenue. Player of the game is going to go to Music in the jungle. This is one of his better games in a while, I think, on the Skarner. I think he's actually been really good for this team in the back half of the regular season. I've talked about that a lot in the regular season on this channel, but I think his emergence as a jungler that you have to take seriously no matter who you are, to, no, like regardless of the fact that you're one of the top teams in the league, I think that emergence is just so integral and so important for Blue Water to be able to continue to generate prio and pressure in a lot of these situations. And this Skarner game was awesome. B5 Skarner. Also Skarner, again, kind of the NA tech at the current moment. Not a lot of other regions are playing Skarner really at all. And the ones that are, are playing him in the top lane. We're really not seeing Skarner jungle be like the priority pick, but we saw it in the LCS playoffs in the video that I covered yesterday. And we're seeing it here in the NACL as well. A lot of teams opting into Skarner. It makes more sense in a full fearless format. I think Skarner is definitely still playable for his role, but he's not nearly as much of a bully as he was like when he first got reworked at the beginning of this split. You know, I think he's fallen into an interesting place, but it's just kind of intriguing to see the priority that North America in particular puts on this champion. Because again, basically no other region is playing him really at any level and so just at least something to point out but music looked awesome being able to set up those quote-unquote wombo combos with the rel and with the rumble ultimate it's really fun to watch and i think music did a great job on it i want to give a big shout out to quacker uh, this can be kind of a difficult game to survive in because the Cassante was doing at least okay in the early game but quacker again on something that can just be a bit of a team fight beast in terms of the damage that he's able to output that's where he wants to be he doesn't want to be malphite who's setting things up for the rest of his team he wants to be the one that's actually 
actively dealing a lot of the damage in these fights, and that's what he's able to do on something like Rumble, Samakin, Levitate, Rovex in particular, I thought had a really good game here on the Rel. Um, just generally a very good performance from Blue Water. I know the scoreline makes it look like it was a bit of a stomp. This game was close until it wasn't. Like, it just completely pulled away as we continue to move along. But, you know, for a lot of this game, it was, well, you know, if Blue Water ends up breaking through, then they're going to be able to end it. But right now, it's not really, like, clear, right? It's not done. And so credit to Disguised for at least trying to stay in it, but they were not nearly as good on the other side of this matchup. This is not a great way to respond to that Game 2 victory. To just go right back down in Game number 3, I don't think is particularly ideal. Dud of the game could basically go to anyone not named Young. I think Young was the only player even trying to do anything in this game on the Oriana, but it's got to go to one of Minui or Tenacity, in my opinion. You could probably give this to Yukino as well, but just all of them kind of letting this team down either in the early or in the late game. Yukino got completely out jungled, I would say, and definitely didn't really have any pressure or really anything on the Xinjiao. Tenacity really threw a pretty good laning phase. Like, he, he was in a decent position and just was not able to hang on to it. This was not nearly as good as his Kennen game. Quacker was able to get back into it and, quite frankly, just completely outplay him in the back half of this. But I'm going to give Dud of the game to Manui. Uh, I just don't think he was doing any damage. I understand that this is one of those situations where you're playing into Rel, Rumble, Skarner, Talia, and it's like, okay, as the Varus, you have to play so safe, you have to play so scared, and you can never really be in a position where you're stepping up and, like, attempting to contest. But if you're going to have that happen, then you need to at least have the build to be able to break through that, and obviously there are real questions about this build. Um, there have been a lot of post-match threads in the LPL and the LCK talking about this, and it just doesn't really seem to be all that consistent. I think it's fine, but generally speaking, we saw the negatives of it here. This is always going to be a difficult game for a low-mobility carry like Varus to end up playing out in the end, but uh, it had to be better than this, because this was not a particularly good performance. But like I said, Tenacity, Yukino, Manui, one of those three probably should be getting dead of the game. It's just whoever you want to end up giving it to, depending on the circumstance. But DSG now, once again, with their backs up against the wall. A familiar spot for them going into Game 4, one game away from being eliminated here in the playoffs. They have to win this, or they are on their way out, and they make that reverse sweep look a lot less cool. And then, for Blue Otter on the other side, they can win this and move on to the top five. That would be a massive accomplishment they're already in the midst of the best run that any newly promoted team has ever had in the NACL. They could perhaps expand even further upon that with another win. So are they going to be able to close this out in game number four or is Disguise going to be able to keep this alive and push us to yet another Silver Scrapes game number five? Well, the winner of game number four was... DSG. They are going to take game number four. They're going to tie up this series at two apiece, and for the second day in a row, DSG will be going to a Silver Scrapes game number five. This is a hard road, man. Playing ten games in two days is not an easy task for basically any team in the world, but DSG definitely hanging in there, showing their resilience, showing that they are not a team that you can give up on regardless of what's happening either early in a series or you know what you took away from the regular season or or maybe even what you expected from the roster on paper. You just can't give up on this team. For Blue Otter on the other side, this was probably their worst performance of the series up until this point. This was a slaughter. I think the game time definitely lies to you. This should have been done significantly shorter uh, than what actually happened. This was not a close game really under any circumstances. There were many flaws in what Blue Otter ended up drafting, but maybe they were saving their actual strong picks for game number five because I, I just really hate this draft, quite frankly, from Blue Otter, and I'll talk about that in a second. I think that there are a couple of picks on this that I just think are have been bait over the course of the last few months. But for DSG, player of the game kind of has to go to Yukino. It's either Yukino or Young. I mean, it's the setup or the follow through. It's just whatever you think is more important. What tips it over the edge to me in favor of Yukino is just, I really want to make the point that Sejuani is like mega broken. <laughs> like We've already known this. If you follow my other coverage of like other regions of the LPL and the LCK and things like that, even the LEC, I talk all the time about how I think Sejuani is just so ridiculously strong and is so consistent and there is a reason that every single year, regardless of what position she's in uh, going into the playoffs, she always becomes like the highest priority champion in every single region's playoffs. And it's because of things like this, like games like this, where you just learn very quickly, oh, Sej is really good in the early game. She actually has a lot of tempo and can create opportunities. And she's also like the 
best tank in the game, maybe outside of Maokai. Like, I don't know, at least in terms of the jungle position. Like, there is almost no flaw in Sejuani's game. She's just so versatile, and that makes, like, watching it in full Fearless even more interesting because that becomes more and more apparent when you watch a team like Blue Otter have to go to something like a Mumu in the jungle, and then you see, like, DSG with Sejuani on the other side of the matchup. It's like, oh, like, this is the difference between Sej and so many other junglers that try to fill a similar role to her. So Yukino gets it for me purely just to emphasize how good of a champion Sejuani is at the current moment. I think, of course, Young deserves a lot of credit for taking advantage of the Sejuani creations here on the Silas. I like Silas as a pick. I've always liked Silas. I think he offers some interesting team dynamics, and especially into things like Amumu and obviously Shen. Like, you gain so much value throughout a lot of this game just purely from the ultimate, and so you feel good about that, but Young is so adept at being this team's primary damage carry. It's continuously fun to watch for, I think, a lot of people, and he was able to do a lot throughout the map. Manui was doing a billion damage. That's what happens when you have to play into a Fed of Felios. Very fun. Poom and Tenacity were good as well. Poom was really good on the Blitz. We actually saw some really good hooks in this game, but generally this was the damage carries of Young and Manui kind of stepping up and, and really taking what they were given by Yukino to create a really dangerous comp. And we'll talk about Blue Water here. I just really don't like this draft. I think that there are a couple of bait picks, none bigger than Amumu. I've talked about this quite a bit. I can't even remember the last time this champion did anything. Maybe I'm just a little bit, like, shell-shocked, not only from this game, but from, like, Cloud9 playing it in the LCS playoffs, and just generally what we've seen from it. We've seen a couple of LCK and LPL teams actually prioritize it as well. You know, Spika's been another player that's played a lot of Amumu, and I just, I can't remember the last time this champion ever felt like it was actually doing the thing that it was supposed to do. I think generally you can combo Amumu with a couple of the other, you know, popular picks in the meta, but comboing it with Jinx and with Shen, like, I just don't really understand the idea behind this draft. I think you're really lacking a lot of priority, and you lost really hard early game. The moment that music really got behind, by the way, music is dead of the game. I don't think the Amumu really did anything, but the moment that that champion started to lose its relevance, there was really no way to get back into this if you were Blue Otter. Like, there was no saving grace. Like, the, the Syndra was already losing. The Silas had already been enabled. The Jinx was definitely not going to be on the same page as the Aphelios in terms of the damage that they were going to be able to output in the later half of the game, and if all of your gold is going to go on Shen in the top lane, like, what are you supposed to to do even poppy in the support position like i like poppy support but you have to do it into the right comps i'm not exactly sure this was the right opportunity to be pulling out something like a poppy on r5 maybe you save that for a game number five so i don't really know i just think that this is one of those games where you're like i, I don't know how we play it right like i i, I don't maybe i'm overrating it overestimating it let me know what you think down in the comments if you think that i'm being too harsh on this draft i just i don't think it's a particularly good one for a team that is typically very very good at finding off meta draft picks i just i'm not a huge fan of the amumu uh, but this team clearly is. But now we're moving into a Silver Scrapes game number five. Again, back-to-back -back days for those for DSG. Just a crazy grind that they've been on. Blue Otter definitely probably a bit more rested, but DSG has all of the momentum. Not only did they win their game five in the previous series, but this team has been entirely resilient. This org has always kind of been known as being resilient in these playoffs. So we'll see what ends up happening to them. Only one team is going to be able to move on. The other will be eliminated in sixth place. Who will it be? Well, the winner of game number five was... Blue Otter. They are going to take game number five. They're going to take this series three to two, and they are going to be moving on to face Supernova in a first round rematch, a bit of a rivalry rematch here in the third round of the lower bracket. This is a massive win for Blue Otter. Obviously, I can't overstate just how important it was for them to pick this up. You know, obviously, I think people would have actually bought in like, hey, this was a really good year for Blue Otter. They finished top six. That's really great. Even if they had lost this, but winning this, putting them in top five with all the confidence in the world with a really good read on the current meta and a very deep champion pool for basically the entire team. This is a threat. This team is a genuine threat the rest of this year, the rest of this playoff run. Everybody's got to watch out for them. For DSG on the other side. This is obviously a very disappointing way to go. Back-to-back uh, -back silver scrapes. I can't imagine how exhausted these players probably are having to play 10 games in two days, but you know, they put up a great fight, and they showed a ton of resilience. I think I had lower expectations for DSG in this playoff run than most did. I think I had them going out in the first, like, group, um, depending on who ended up losing in that upper bracket. I just didn't think that they were a team that was better than a lot of the teams that were in upper bracket. A team like Blue Water, I, you know, was probably better than them, and I thought, you know, that Team Liquid or FlyQuest should have probably been better than them. That's not how it ended up working out, and DSG, obviously, you know, they have to be praised for that, but, you know, a couple of mistakes, you know, some 
some sloppy execution here in game five does end up costing them. Again, how much do you want to attribute that to exhaustion and just the sheer amount of games that these players played? I don't know. They should have been locked in and obviously this game should have been a little bit closer, but it just wasn't. Blue Otter was definitely, uh, I guess, the ones to get a lot of the big advantages throughout this game, even if DSG did do a good job of like trying to keep it close. So let's talk about it. Player of the game is going to go to Samakin in the mid lane on his signature Zoe. He gets it here in game five. As you can see, yet another game five, no bans on the table. There's no way to take away any pocket picks that may have made it through, uh, that may have, you know, not been picked in the first four games. There is no way to deny those early on in draft anymore with no bans. And so you're looking at a situation where Samakin's allowed to get his best champion. He's allowed to fight in a lot of these close quarter exchanges. That final Baron fight, like, why are you fighting into Zoe in such close quarters? There's just really no explanation. Zoe is one of those champions that can really punish small mistakes like that. And that's exactly what Samakin was able to do. A great game from him. But player of the series as a whole for me is going to go to Rovex, the support here for Blue Water. I really do think he was the best player on the Rift here today. And I've just been so impressed by Rovex individually as a player over the past couple of weeks. I think he's really cemented himself as, as I said, one of the most interesting like support prospects in the league. It reminds me so much of how we were talking about someone like Zyko last year, and now we're talking about Scary Jerry and Zyko as like the best bot lane. I think Levitate, Rovex, they could have a very similar leap into next year just being the best bot lane in the NACL if they continue this upward trajectory they've been on. Rovex was amazing. Of course, the Yasuo here being kind of the counterpick to uh, Manui Seraphine that he is very very famous for. He just was able to really take advantage of that, and he looked great on the pick. Levitate was good on the Senna, did a ton of damage, way more than I expected in this game. Music was great across this whole series. I genuinely loved how he was able to play basically every game that wasn't the Amumu game in game four. You know, Quacker was solid, I think especially when he was able to get some leads in the early game. Otter was just better. Like, there is nothing else left to say. They're moving on to round three, and, and DSG's year is going to be over. This is obviously a bit of an underperformance for an org that had really high expectations. I had high expectations for this team going into the year. I thought that they were going to be a top team, that they were going to be able to compete for a title and for a finals appearance at the very least, and that just never really material materialized, but I still think that there is a lot of positive stuff to take away for DSG in a series like this. I think someone like Yukino looked way better in the playoffs than he did in the regular season, and that's a big plus. I thought Young had a really good playoff run. All things considered, Manui, I thought, played his best League of Legends in the playoffs that he basically played all year long. There were a lot of exciting moments. Poom, I thought, was good. Tenacity really had some step-up, big performances. You know, there were a lot of positives. It just didn't really manifest here in Game 5. The reason I talk about them feeling like they were just kind of burnt out and exhausted a bit in this Game 5 is because they really just were not very good mechanically, and that's really not where I would expect DSG to really fumble and falter. Obviously, people are going to play to that last Baron fight where basically everyone missed everything. I can I don't think a single ultimate hit anyone. Yuki no, I think hit one person with his Wukong ult, but outside of that, it was kind of a disaster, but you know, outside of that, I think just getting themselves into that position, you know, forcing that Baron in a close quarter space against a, you know, Senna, Zoe, like it's just really not an ideal set of circumstances and DSG paid the price for it. But again, really good split, all things considered. Tenacity, by the way, is dead of the game for game five. He was the only one who I felt wasn't doing anything throughout a majority of this game. I just didn't feel like the Darius was impactful at all. Even Manui and Poom, who I don't think played particularly well in this fifth game, were at least trying to do things and they were also counterpicked on the other side. You know, Yukino and Young were trying to set the tempo and the pressure early. The Wukong actually got quite a bit of gold on him, but as you guys know, Wukong, another champion that I think is a little bit of a, of a bait pick right now. I'm just not super sold on Wukong individually, so even with all that gold, he really wasn't able to get in and stick on any of the primary carries. I guess that's really what to say about DSG in this game, but again, you know, their heads are probably a little low after this loss. I think the expectation was bare minimum like top five. That was probably what they were thinking, especially after beating Team Liquid. They probably felt like, oh, we beat TL. We can definitely beat Blue Water, who's probably worse than them. Not the case. Blue Otter is a, a team that you have to be paying attention to. They are definitely one of the scariest in the entirety of the NACL right now. And honestly, like they're in the top five. Who knows how far they can go in the playoffs if things continue to go this way. All right, but that is going to do it for my NACL round number two overview and analysis video here in the summer split playoffs up on the screen. The updated bracket 
after all of the games that we've already gotten. We are down to our top five teams, and wouldn't you know it, it's the top five seeds that end up surviving. Uh, next weekend is jam-packed. It's every single series except for the finals, and so we are going to be splitting it up into two videos. I will let you guys know now I'm going to be out of town for all of next weekend, and so it's going to be structured a bit differently. I'm going to try to get that NACL round three video out uh, basically the night of, and we'll see how that ends up going. Hopefully I can get it done before we end up leaving on Saturday to, uh, to, to go, but um, you know, I'll keep you guys posted. I'm sure I'll post something here on the community page uh, just to kind of update on that, but expect that on Friday night, basically as soon as that second series ends. I do want to split it up into two videos because if I did one video, I'd have to cut this back down into talking about the series as a whole. There's just not enough time to be able to film for best of fives in like full length like this. And so I really want to try to make sure I give each series its own time. And, you know, especially with best of fives, I want to lock in and really talk about them all. So, you know, that's what I'm probably going to be doing on Friday. But up on the screen, of course, the bracket will quickly preview how I think it's going to go. Um, as you guys know, I do think Dragon Steel is the best team in the NACL at the current moment. I think Fear is by far the closest to number two. I think whoever ends up winning that series is going to be in a great position to take the entire tournament. But I have Dragon Steel as my projected in the finals, but Fear moving down, of course, into the semifinals at the very worst. They are top three. Um, that means whoever wins that, by the way, qualifies for the Americas tournament as well, which is a really big boon. Uh, then you've got Supernova, Blue Otter, FlyQuest, all on the bottom side of the bracket. I think this could genuinely go any way, especially because I'm not super sold on FlyQuest individually as a team. I think that there is a world in which Blue Otter ends up making top three. I think there is a world in which FlyQuest just obliterates either Supernova or Blue Otter, but whoever ends up winning the Supernova Blue Water series is going to have their work cut out for him with the defending champion champs who do have a lot to work on and do have a lot to figure out, but they still have to be favored in a lot of matchups. I think Blue Otter might be better than Supernova, especially with the confidence they've generated in the previous two series, but we'll have to wait and see until next weekend to see how that works out. But that's going to do it. I do hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, leave a like. It really does mean a lot to me. It lets me know you guys are enjoying the content, and it does help get this video out to a lot more people, which I'm always very appreciative of. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button. We don't only post about the NACL, although, as I said, we're going to be posting about it for the rest of playoffs, but we cover all four of the major regions as well. So if you want a comprehensive overview of everything going on in LOL Esports, this is the place for it. Hit subscribe and hit that bell so you can be notified when those videos do go live. But of course... With all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day. And I will see you all.